Hello, darlings. Coming to you live from my porch in Cleveland Heights to talk to you about who I am and what I write. My name is Marie Vibert, and I'm a science fiction author. So we're going to be talking about biker gangs in outer space, classism, sexism, and building a better future. Um, this is my novel, Galactic Hellcats. It came out this year, um, March 2021 is when it came out. Uh, Vernacular Press is the name of the publisher. You can get it at Barnes & Noble, you can get it at Max Bax, you can get it at Loganberry, you can get it at Apple Tree Books, I think. Um, support your local bookstores. I also um, write short fiction. So this is Analog Science Fiction and Fact Magazine. And there's my name right there on the bottom. There's another one. Um, that was the July, August 2021 analog. This is Fantasy and Science Fiction magazine for uh, May, June of 2021. They put my name right there on the top. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to prove to you that I'm, I'm not just some schmuck. I, I, I've been working at this for a while so that maybe like this makes me more interesting. Amazing stories, this photo, the cover image is my story. There's my name down there. And I've even had stories in China. Um, this is Science Fiction World. You'll have to trust me, that's what it says, unless you speak Chinese or read Chinese. I had to have my buddy Kevin point out where my name is in there. Um, thank you, Kevin. So I've sold over 70 short stories, um, mostly to pro-rate magazines, which is defined by the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers of America as eight cents a word. It's it's nothing that's going to make me quit my day job, but it does not hurt. And economics are important to me. Um, I grew up working class. My dad was a construction worker, a laborer. And I mean, we were on food stamps when food stamps were actual paper, you know. And uh, first home I remember was the Euclid Projects on 200th Street. And a lot of where I come from comes into being a science fiction author. Um, escapism was so important to me as a kid. Life was rough and there were these books I could get at the library where cars could fly and sidewalks moved and you could have a best friend who was a robot um, and you could travel to other worlds see other people, other ways of being. So I was always going to be a science fiction writer. I mean, just always. I remember in college, I went to Case Western. Um, I majored in geology, but I took all the English classes I could. And I remember in one of my first English classes, we were, they were critiquing a short story I wrote and somebody was like, but why is this science fiction? You know, you could have just written um, written it in a suburb and, you know, it's really about this girl's relationship with her mother. And I was like, yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have written it in a suburb. I wouldn't have written it if it wasn't science fiction. So lecture mode, what does it do then? Why is it important to be science fiction? One way is just to separate from reality. Um, you're able to talk about politics without people immediately bringing their own background into it or their own preconceived notions because they may have an opinion on American politics, but they don't have an opinion on Venusian politics. You can talk about racism and sexism and classism. You can make it a metaphor. Um, it's really about robots. I write a lot about robots. I'm not going to lie. The robots are my working class. But it helps me write a story that is an escape from reality, but that's also addressing reality. And sometimes it's not that far of an escape, if you feel me. We're, we're escaping to reality. Stripping away the baggage 
to get at what it's really about. Now let's talk about the book itself. Oops, I picked up the magazine instead. We're going to talk about Galactic Hellcats and where this came from. Um, because this story is almost as old as I am. It all starts when I'm 12 years old and this is like 1989. My twin sister Gracie drew a sketch on one of our school notebooks of three punk chicks lounging together. One of them kind of looked like our friend Margie. Um, and one had a braid mohawk and one was just really messy and punky. And at the time I fancied myself a junior novelist. I had written a novel that was what you would expect from a novel from an 11 year old. And like sixth grade, I wrote another one, which was all like time travel. And I thought I was really something. So I saw this and I was like, I'm going to write a short story about these three girls. That's what I'm going to do because I'm not just a novelist at 12. And it turned out not to be a short story. I ended up filling the entire notebook. I borrowed my sister's pink pen without asking. So it wasn't borrowing. I stole her pen. I used the whole pen up. I'm a bad sister. And I wrote this novel, this juvenile novel, about these three punk girls who were a space motorcycle gang. They had flying space motorcycles. Um, inspiration, probably, you know, Return of the Jedi, the speeder bikes. It was around that time that came out. Also, Bubblegum Crisis, Pris had her cool motorcycle. I, I wanted a space motorcycle. I would ride my bike around the neighborhood and imagine that my bike could transform itself into a spaceship and that there was an AI in the bike that was like my sassy computer best friend um, wanted to kill all humans. It's the origins of another character, Celeste. Um, I've written a couple of things with Celeste, but she's just a bad killer robot friend. Your sassiest killer robot friend. So, what happened with this thing? I wrote it, I'm 12, I finished it, I put it in a box in my closet. I started high school. I revised my first novel in high school. I learned to use the computer in the computer lab in high school, and I retyped my first novel, which was about a girl not unlike me, who is a time-traveling a uh, secret agent for the possibly evil alien corporation. It's not very clear what the agency is trying to do, but she's a secret agent, but she's also 13 years old because that's the way the world works when you're 13. And I had this dream that I would publish by the time I was 18 because Isaac Asimov was 18 or 19, I think, when he sold his first short story. So I had to do it by the time I was 18. And I sent that novel off to three publishers and got three rejection letters. And then I was 18. And I cried and my life was over. I went to college. I took writing classes. Years passed. I tried and tried to be a short story writer. Because everybody said, you know, you can break into novels if you write short stories. So I learned the short story and I struggled with it. And it took me, it took me a decade of con constant work to sell my first short story. I sold my first short story in 2007. I submitted my first short story for publication probably in 92. So. Yeah, almost exactly 10 years of work to break into short stories. And it was four years after my first short story sale that I had my second. So that was rough. But I started feeling like I knew what I was doing. And I was selling short stories. And of course, I was always working on novels. 
I never stopped working on novels the whole time I was working on short stories because novels were my first love. Novels are what we all grow up reading. Novels are the dominant form of fiction in the United States. But ironically, this started as a short story. Not just when I was 12 and I thought I would try to write my first short story and it turned into a novel, but also in, I think it was 2014 or 2015 or 2016. It was one of those years. I was doing a write-a-thon for the Clarion Foundation. Clarion is a group that runs a writing workshop to teach wannabe science fiction writers like me how to write science fiction short stories. And I went to Clarion and it was mind blowing. It was invaluable experience. And to pay some of that back every year, I do their write-a-thon where I publicly pledge to write 50 short stories in six weeks. And if I make it, people donate money to the Clarion write-a-thon in my name. So, yes, this would have been 2014, because it was the year after I went to Clarion, and I pledged to write 50 short stories in six weeks. And I ran out of ideas. That's a lot of short stories. To That's more than one a day. It was like one and a half a day of just writing rough drafts of short stories, um, which was actually a very good exercise. I had done it the I had done it in 2012, the year before I went to Clarion. So this was my second time doing it. And I found that it really got me to focus on what is a story as a unit? What makes it a complete draft? So there I was struggling to come up with, you know, story idea number 25. And I thought, I'll just write something fun. I'm just going to write about that space motorcycle gang I wrote about in high school, right? Junior high. I'm going to write about them because I already know that story. I know it cold. I've daydreamed about it for 20 years. So I wrote a short story called The Formation of the Stardust Gang. And despite the fact that I told myself that um, 1,000 words was the cutoff for what would count as a short story for my write-a-thon, this bad boy clocked in at 10,000 words. And I wrote it in a mad rush over three days, cranking out other short drafts on the side. And when the write-a-thon was over, I went back and looked at it and I said, you know what? This is pretty good. It's a bit long for a short story, but it's pretty good. So I sent it to my writer's workshop and my writer's workshop is just the Cajun Sushi Hamsters from Hell, we call ourselves, and we're just a group of 15 to 20 science fiction and fantasy writers in the Cleveland area. We meet at each other's houses when there's not a pandemic, and we sit around in a circle, we read each other's stories, and we talk about them. And I remember this critique because every single person said the same thing. They said, Marie, you're rushing this. This is a novel. Um, you need to expand this story into a novella, at least. And I said, you know what? Yeah, it is rushed. There's a lot of summary in this, because I wanted to tell the story of how the bike gang started. So it's like one sentence, you know, Key got her bike secondhand from her friend, but she told everybody, she made everybody think she stole it. Uh, Margot got her bike from back by blowing her back pay from the military, you know. These were one sentence beginning bits, but I could expand each of those into a scene to show how Key got her bike and how Margot got her bike. So that year for NaNoWriMo, that's exactly what I did. And I wrote out the chapter titles as my outline. First chapter, how Key got her ride. Second chapter, how Margot got her ride. Third chapter, how Key met Margot. Fourth chapter, how Key met Zuleika. You know, fifth chapter, how Zuleika got her ride. 
Um, and it was a lot of fun. I managed to expand it out to like about 56,000 words. I, I won the NaNoWriMo. National Novel Writing Month, if you didn't know, is November, where people challenge themselves to write 50,000 words of a novel in one month. So in case I forgot to define that. And I had this novel draft, and then I waited on it for a bit, let it sink in, revised it, got it up to 60K, showed it to my writing workshop. They tore it apart, got it up to 70K, started submitting it places, got like 70 rejections from agents. I thought female biker gang in outer space rescues gay prince was a golden um, elevator pitch, but apparently not so much with agents. Um, my query letters did not work. However, in 2019, I just tweeted, I have a lot of other writing projects I should be working on, but I keep going back to revise the space biker girl gang novel. And the J.M. McDermott, the publisher for Vernacular Books, just immediately responded with, hey, can I see it? So I sent it to him and he liked it and he bought it and it came out this year. So that's the story of my first novel, Galactic Hellcats, story of three biker babes in outer space rescuing a gay prince. It's important to me that the prince is gay because I didn't want the rescue to be romantic. I did. I really have a problem with the action adventure trope that you rescue the prince or princess and they fall in love with you. You know, that's that's kind of a skeevy situation to base your relationship on. So by making the prince gay, he's not going to end up with any of these chicks. And the three girls are all very different. Uh, Margot's gay too. I decided that it wouldn't make sense for there to just be three straight ladies and one gay boy, so I made one of the ladies gay too. Um, Margot is a military vet, and just like my dad said, his buddies blew their back pay from the military to get motorcycles. That's what she does. And she's kind of the, the straight one. I mean, like in the joke sense, the straight man in the joke, she's the steady, reliable one who keeps everybody on pace, who asks how are we going to pay for that, um, who doesn't want to run from the cops. She's, she's the suburban middle class one. And then Key, who is kind of my ego insert, is the, she's the poor one. Actually, she's homeless at the beginning of the story. Technically still homeless at the end of the novel, but you know, she's got her biker gang now. Um, and Zuleika is a little rich girl because I wanted them all to be from different classes. I wanted to show different ways of being and different ways of interacting with the idea of a motorcycle or a spaceship. Um, Zuleika, for her, her bike is a hobby and she's still bored. For Key, it's like, it's escape. It's it's the dream of getting out. For Margot, it's safety. Um, she, she's terrified of depressurization, and having her own enclosed spaceship keeps her makes her know that she's not going to be sucked out an airlock. And so each one of them has something that they want, something that they need, which isn't necessarily what they want. And by joining together, they're able to discover just what that is, what they need rather than what they want, um, and form a lifelong bond that will last at least 14 books, I hope. I don't know. I'm working on the sequel now, um, as well as I'm working on a paper for the British Science Fiction Association's Vector magazine 
on the depiction of class in science fiction, specifically looking at a statistical analysis of the class identity of main characters in prominent science fiction and fantasy novels. So that'll come out soon, I hope. And I'm also shopping around about eight short stories right now. It's small for me. I try to keep about 10 to 15 stories in the mail at a time. I'm checking my coming soon on my website, marievibert.com. It's more useful to me than anybody else. I go there to check things like, what do I have coming soon? Uh, Juniper's Song in Trouble the Waters, which is an anthology. Juniper's Song actually features the ship folk who are a kind of a subplot in this. We get to meet the ship folk. Carnival Fire should be on Drabblecast at some point. Um, that's been pending for a while. I don't know when it's coming out. Room to Live, which is about homelessness and AI and process friction, will be in analog science fiction, in fact, pretty soon. What We Have Done, a romance about the singularity, will also be in analog after that. Loving the Falls will be in Cast of Wonders, which is a young adult podcast. Loving the Falls is about coming back from the dead and your relationship with your dad when you're a teenager. Three Little Arcologies will be on Little Blue Marble, which is a lovely online magazine devoted to environmental science fiction. And Three Little Arcologies is about affordable housing, sustainable housing in Cleveland, um, sort of, kind of. And The Three Little Pigs, also sort of, kind of. So that's kind of an overview of the sort of things that I write and where to find them. If you want to find out more, go to mariebibbert.com. I'm almost always on Twitter at at Marizy. Um, M-A-R-E-A-S-I-E. -E. There's a link on my website. I know, it's a terrible, terrible Twitter handle. I'm also on Instagram, much less often, and chilling around Case Western Reserve or Cleveland Heights, where you may find me being me. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Okay, bye.